Well, hello there. Well, it's time for me to watch another film series. This time I'm going to watch all five of the original Planet of the Apes films. Why? Well, because I'm an old man with nothing else to do. Well, hello there, old man Kelly here. Jeff to my friends, and you can call me Jeff. So, I've got this box set of the original five Planet of the Apes films, and it's Saturday morning about 7.15 a.m. The holidays are past us, so I don't have a lot to do, so I thought today I would watch all five of these in order, just like I did with the six Tremors films about a month ago. I'll comment after each film and tell you exactly what I thought about it, but don't worry, I'm going to turn the camera off as I watch the movie, and I'll, I'll keep my comments short. Now, if you've got access to these films, you might want to watch them with me. Then you can leave a comment below on just what I got wrong with my comments. And this will be just the original five. Maybe someday in the future I'll do this again with the new film series. But one thing I'm never going to do is watch that crappy Tim Burton Marky Mark film that came out in 2001. You couldn't pay me to watch that piece of crap again. So on to the original film, the original classic Charlton Heston Planet of the Apes. If you're going to watch it with me, you might want to turn this off now and join me again once the film is over. I'll be back. Damn you! Damn you to hell! You blew it up! <laughs> Welcome back. What can I say about this movie that hasn't been said before? I just finished watching the original Planet of the Apes. Charlton Heston, Roddy McDowell, Kim Hunter, star in a film directed by Franklin J. Schaffner and written by Michael Wilson in the Twilight Zone's Rod Serling. It's certainly, in my opinion, the best of all the Apes movies, and I include the new batch in that. There are so many wonderful parts. Right away we start out with, right after the crash, with Charlton Heston being such a jerk to the other guys, especially Robert Gunner as Landon. He just doesn't let up and it's too funny. Of course, Jerry Goldsmith's music is iconic and wonderful. And one of the parts of the film that's, that's often overlooked is its anti-religion theme. I mean, the apes have a religion that's no less real to them than the religions of the people of the earth today. Yet we know as an audience that it's all BS, and it's pretty funny. And of course, we have the surprise ending. Spoiler, it was Earth all along. That had to be a Rod Serling idea. I mean, he was the master of the twist ending. Just watch any Twilight Zone that he ever wrote. And it wasn't in the original book. There are so many great quotable lines to this movie, but, but you know them. I'm not going to say them. Now, I rate each film, but the first film always gets five stars because I judge the rest of the films as it compares to the original. So, of course, this film gets five stars. Now on to Beneath the Planet of the Apes from 1970. I'll be back in 95 minutes with a report on that. This is an odd sequel. That's perhaps because production started off rough when Charlton Heston didn't want to do it. You see, sequels weren't the big thing back then like they are today. So he agreed as a favor to the producer to be in the movie in a cameo role as long as he died at the end and his paycheck went to charity. James Franciscus took over and as good an actor as he is, he's really no replacement for Charlton Heston. Also, Roddy McDowell isn't in the film, except in flashbacks, David Watson taking over the Cornelius role. And director Franklin J. Schaffner was busy with the movie Patton, so they got television director Ted Post to take over. Now, the movie picks up right where the last one left off, with Heston yelling at the Statue of Liberty. Then we cut to another astronaut who has just crashed on the planet, and he immediately runs into Nova from the first movie, which is an amazing bit of luck. The whole movie centers around the strange race of mutants who can remove their skin and worship the atomic bomb. They have this weird mind control thing where they can make men fight, 
And when the apes attack their underground city, the fun really begins, though it takes forever to get to the action. And there's a 60s sensibility to the film. There's these chimpanzee protesters who are fighting the upcoming war and they all get arrested. And I only can assume Vietnam had something to do with that. The thing is, this film was done for cheap. While the first film had a budget of like $6 million, this was done for under three, and it shows. Some of the actors playing apes are clearly wearing cheap Halloween monkey masks, which is bad. And some of the underground subway shots where Franciscus learns that this is Earth looks pretty cheap. The story isn't bad, it's not good, but it's not bad. And while it's original, and obviously there was an effort not to remake the first movie, it doesn't have the intelligence or, or the humor of the first movie. And it ends with the Earth blowing up with the idea that there would never be another Planet of the Apes movie. So of course there was. So I give this film three stars. I was going to give it two and a half, but I thought for originality I would give it that extra half a star. So now I'm on to Escape from the Planet of the Apes from 1971. I'll be back in 98 minutes with a review on that film. No, let's make it 108 minutes I'll be back because I'm going to grab a bite to eat. Okay, I have to apologize. It didn't take me five hours to watch Escape from Planet of the Apes, but uh, family stuff got in the way, but I'm back now. Well, what if three apes somehow found Taylor's spaceship, retrieved it from the bottom of the sea, repaired it, learned how to fly it, and got away from the Earth before it was blown up, all in between the time that they helped James Franciscus and the apes attack the mutants. Oh, and somehow the spaceship went back in time to the 1970s. If your audience has a large enough suspension of disbelief, you may have a movie. You see, that's what happens in Escape from Planet of the Apes. Cornelius Zira and another ape, Dr. Milo, travel back to modern day Earth and the comedy begins. It's basically a reversal of the first movie. And Ronnie McDowell is back, playing Cornelius, and Kim Hunter is still Zira. Early in the film, Dr. Milo gets killed, so this is basically the earthly adventures of Cornelius and Zira. It all goes well for the pair until the people of the Earth realize what's in store for them in the future, that the apes become the dominant species. After that, the pair go on the run, and that's complicated by Zira being pregnant. And spoilers, it doesn't end well for our couple. But a circus owner, played by Ricardo Montalban, takes in the little baby, little Milo, and that leads into our next film. Now I actually enjoyed this film, primarily because of its humor, so I'll give it three and a half stars. Now on to Conquest of the Planet of the Apes. I'll be back in 88 minutes with a report on that. So Conquest of the Planet of the Apes, the fourth film in the franchise, takes place in the far off year of 1991, and things have changed a lot since the third film. In between the films, back in 1983, there was a disease that wiped out all the cats and dogs, so the apes became the new pets, and eventually they became slaves. So in 1991, with the United States being in a police state, there are concerns about an ape uprising. They're also, they're also looking for that ape that can speak like a human from the last film. So we begin as Ricardo Montalban and Milo arrive in the big city. Roddy McDowell returns, this time playing his own son, Milo. He has to pretend to be an ordinary ape, and ordinary apes can't talk. But when Milo sees how bad other apes are being treated, he suddenly yells, lousy human bastards, and this sets up a whole series of bad events. Along the way, Milo is sold as a slave, and he gets a new name, Caesar. Now many of you might know that Caesar is the name of the main ape from the new series who leads the ape revolution, and it's the same in this movie. This film is very dark. I have the Blu-ray and it has two versions, the theatrical cut and the original more violent cut. In the original more brutal film, Caesar gives a very enraged speech at the end before having the governor brutally killed. Back in 1972, apparently this was too dark for audiences, so it was recut with Roddy McDowell redubbing some of his lines to give it a more upbeat ending. 
Personally, I watched the dark version. The thing about this film is, it seems to go full circle, bring us back to the first film. But yet we still have one more film to watch, so we have to see where that takes us. I'm going to give this film three and a half stars just because I like the fact that the filmmakers had the guts to do something this dark. And now on to Battle of the Planet of the Apes from 1973. I'll be back in 93 minutes with my report of that. The battle for the Planet of the Apes begins in North America in around 2670 AD. An orangutan lawgiver, played by John Huston, is standing near a statue of Caesar telling the story of Caesar to a bunch of children. We flash back to the early 21st century where we find Caesar the leader of Ape City, a place where both humans and apes live together though the apes are really in charge and the humans are almost slaves. Now since the time of our last movie there has been a global nuclear war that has destroyed civilization, but the apes are now dressing like they did in the first movie. Now if you've seen some of those new ape films, especially Dawn of the Planet of the Apes, you might actually think that that is a remake of this film because they're very close. In an effort to find information about his parents, Caesar, his human assistant and an orangutan named Virgil go to the Forbidden City to find some recordings that Zira and Cornelius apparently made. In the city are mutants and they worship a nuclear bomb. The mutants follow Caesar back to Ape City and well, it turns into a battle between the two. There's also a gorilla named Aldo who hurts Caesar's son Cornelius, who was named after his father, and Cornelius, spoiler, ends up dying. Again, this movie has two cuts. There's a theatrical cut and an extended cut. And of course, I watched the extended one, though I don't know if it mattered. The thing is, I would expect this film to lead up to the events of the first film, with the humans being animals and whatnot, but it doesn't. The end of this film has the humans and the apes living together in peace as equals. How did the humans become deaf mutes? I guess we'll never know. It does, however, have the mutants worshipping the nuclear bomb, so that's something. Now the very end shot of the film is a close-up of the statue of the face of Caesar, and a little tear runs down. Yeah, I know. I read on Wikipedia that one of the original writers saw that ending shot and said that it was stupid. It turned our stomachs when we saw it. I like the last two films. I'm just the Battle for Planet of the Apes three and a half stars because, well, why not? Pretty much all the films after the original are just like, eh, okay. I guess they're okay to watch once. None of them have the power or the impact of the original, but then again, how could they, right? I'm glad I watched them all, but I don't think I'll ever have any desire to watch any of the sequels again. The original? Yes, I'll watch that many times. Well, thanks for joining me on my little all-day viewing of the five Planet of the Apes movies. I don't know what series I'll do next, but I think next time I'm going to like watch one a week, record a bit, and then after like five, six weeks, how many films there are, I'll, I'll string them together for, for uh, my videos. So anyway, thanks for watching. Talk to you later. Bye.